Bienvenidos a una nueva edición de Trading Risk and Beyond. En esta ocasión vamos a discutir el tema de las tasas de interés, de los modelos de tasas, de la estructura de tasas y cómo estos cambian a lo largo del tiempo para adaptarse a las nuevas circunstancias. Contamos con la presencia de Fabio Mercurio, Global Head of Quantitative Analytics de Bloomberg, Nueva York. Acompáñeme a ver esta interesante discusión que él tuvo durante la Risk Management Training Conference con mi colega Chris Stanley. And welcome to another episode of Trading Risk and Beyond. My name is Chris Stanley and I'm delighted to be joined today by Fabio Mercurio, uh, Global Head of Quantitative Analytics at Bloomberg. Fabio, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to kick off the conversation by discussing a, a topic which has got a lot of attention uh, since the 2008 crisis, which is to do with modeling and specifically model risk. Um, within sort of financial institutions. Um, what would you say are some of the main challenges that uh, traders face today when it comes to assessing model risk? Well, that's a very uh, deep question, very important one. Uh, not only in the current market, uh, I can say that it has been always very important, uh, even before. So the only thing that really changed, according to me, is really the focus and uh, the attention that the whole industry is actually putting on, uh, on this kind of thing. Um, before, I mean, I do remember that people cared about the risk uh, they were facing when using different models. Mm -hmm. For example, it never happened that traders on, uh, only trusted a single model. They always had like a bunch of model, models they were using for pricing purposes, but then when it came to calculating sensitivities, for example, or some some risk number, maybe they were sticking to a single model because that was their preferred choice. And, and it doesn't necessarily me mean that uh, a simpler model was actually doing a worse job. Depending on the situation, a simpler model could actually be even better to capture some, some of the, the features that were important. So some of the risk numbers, some sensitivities, and so on. Um, I will say that nowadays people are more aware, mm. and more aware not only inside a financial institution, because that awareness was there before, but mostly we'll say maybe in the trading floor, in the risk management department. Now that awareness is actually spread out outside the bank industry. So especially regulators are very well aware that there are many sources of risk. So they are trying to also impose new, uh, say, uh, risk models and new ways of capturing those kind of risks that have always been present to one another, but have been kind of neglected. And uh, in particular, I also want to mention the, um, the XVA adjustments mm. that are the new type of risks that uh, traders are facing nowadays. Um, before, people were kind of uh, okay with uh, uh, risk-neutral valuations, pretending that counterparties were kind of default-free, there was no funding risk, uh, that there was, um, say, no capital uh, requirement mm -hmm. that was kind of penalizing your investments. But nowadays, this kind of, uh, say, costs need to be properly factored in in your transactions, and traders do care about them because they need to hedge them. And there are also a lot of debates on how to uh, transfer those costs from maybe traders to bond holders, shareholders, or even to, you know, to clients. So uh, from one side, to summarize, I think model risk has always been very important, and uh, um, people will always be aware of the challenges, but maybe, maybe internally to a bank, I think that where awareness spread out outside, regulators stepped in, uh, defining new regs, and, uh, and also a new market environment uh, created awareness of new sources of risk like funding risk, credit risk, mm. um, 
capital requirement risk and so on. You talked about the, the XVA there, and is there a sort of a, a sense that there's an increasing complexity in terms of assessing model risk these days? Um, and with that complexity, is there a danger that there are the simply you know, traders either don't want or can't sort of understand the models in the same way that they did before? Um, how do you, is, is that a risk in itself? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there is a, always the risk of not understanding ex exactly what you're doing, right? So, and I will say that this applied also uh, to um, the world before the credit crunch. Mm. People were maybe handling complex models uh, without understanding all the implications of those models. Or with the, they were using overly simplified model, uh, models, think for example of the Gaussian copula, to price very complex deals. Mm. And some kind of summarizing uh, uh, very complex risks into a single number. So um, that lack of awareness was always there. I think now the market is getting even more complex, so the risk you are you are mentioning is actually uh, even more present, but to some extent discarded by the fact that uh, deals are getting simpler, but um, what really is changing is also the, the way we calculate those adjustments, because uh, with regulation asking for, uh, say, new practices, and the next one is going to be the initial margin. Also, the valuation adjustments that we started using after the credit crunch will be impacted. Mm. So it will be crucial to understand how the valuation adjustment that we started uh, familiarizing with will change because of the new valuation adjustments that will be required basically because of new regulations. So yeah. what you are saying is absolutely correct. Okay. It's always like a challenge to understand the impact of new things that you are uh, do you have to do, and how this affects also uh, current positions, and how it does change your mindset and the way you were taking care of the risks you used to uh, hedge before. And there's a training challenge there, as to keeping keeping your people up to date and keeping them, you know, ahead of the ahead of the curve, or at least up to date with the curve, not to get sort of overtaken by it. There is a, uh, yes, there is a change in uh, talents needed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, somebody are saying that, okay, you don't need so much, uh, say, uh, fancy technical background, say, unfortunately, because, okay, that's also my background, so maybe people <laughs> like myself will be less and less needed in the future. But I think it's also important, especially if we need, uh, if we look at the current landscape, to have also a different type of expertise, right? So um, accounting seems to be much more important nowadays than uh, quant finance. And I don't think that quant finance is over, right? So, but necessarily, what really is important is also to add new components to it. So before a quant was really somebody with a strong, uh, say, background in, uh, uh, in math, mm. um, maybe stochastic calculus, numerical techniques, uh, because if, at the end of the day, we need to calculate uh, something explicitly, and we need to, do, to uh, make our models work, and uh, also expertise in, uh, in programming, because we need to write some computer code. Mm. Maybe now we should add also accounting or economic theory, because everything is uh, important, and uh, maybe it was a crime that quants kind of mm. lack that kind of expertise in the first place. I mean, if you had to think about uh, an organization that is particularly effective in or has established you know, an, an organizational-wide model risk structure. I mean, what, what does that look like these days? Is, is, is it even possible? Oh, that's, a, that's a very challenging uh, uh, thing to do. And uh, I mean, uh, I don't think I can give names and you know, I can yeah. mention specific organizations, really. But what, what I can only say is that um, the uh, current regulations Stretch, stress so much the importance of model risk management in general mm. that all top organizations, I would say all organizations, especially in the banking industry, are really taking seriously that task. And when we say like a, a model risk management, we definitely talk about uh, assessing model risk, 
but also putting in place all the procedures and, uh, um, and the requirements that regula regulators are asking. And uh, um, so it's really a problem of governance, of defining a process inside the firm, not just like you know, following some strict recipe that regul regulators uh, are asking you to follow. And uh, given that I'm a quant, and uh, I also want to share like, uh, you know, some, uh, some word about you know, what my peers are doing in, uh, in the bank industry. So because of that, most of my, uh, say, peers are actually being uh, utilized nowadays as, uh, as a writer. So basically what they do, they, they write documentation because that's one of the key requirements in terms of model risk management. Model risk management is really assessing model risk is uh, doing model validation, that's one you know, aspect. I mean, what are some of the perhaps more interesting developments that are taking place in the fixed income area today? That was mine, but I, I look, I understand where you're coming from, and, uh, <laughs> but really it's, uh, um, I will say that, okay, so fixed income has some interesting challenges, especially uh, you know, uh, in recent years, and uh, uh, I will say that uh, the major changes actually occurred in uh, fixed income risk factors after a credit crunch. So I would say if there was a market that was majorly impacted in terms of definition of risk factors was really the fixed income one. Um, and uh, you know, in particular, we saw like uh, the emerging of basis spreads that were virtually uh, non-existent or say at best neglected before, right? So, um, so new risk factors came uh, came up because of the financial crisis. And another interesting thing is really the fact that um, in some of the, in, in the major currencies, interest rate became negative. Yeah. And uh, that's also, you know, uh, I would say uh, thrilling enough, right? So this is <laughs> enough like uh, excitement, I mean, uh, uh, to people like myself, because um, I was telling also today to, you know, to the delegates uh, in, in the workshop, and. Um, that is kind of interesting. And when I started my career as a, as a quant, but also as a PhD student, you know, I was reading articles and papers, and the, the overall opinion was that any uh, model based on the normal distribution, uh, and there were many, maybe you know, short-term models like uh, Hannah White and and things like that, um, they were essentially allowing for arbitrage because you know. Uh, and negative distribution of rates allows for possibility of negative rates and would imply a positive price of a structure like a zero strike floor, which should have intrinsically a zero price. And uh, then the usual answer was, yeah, we know that, but dealing with the normal distribution is so convenient, the tractability you get is, you know, is lost with other distributions, so we use that model because it's, uh, it's easy to understand, it's also very convenient, you can do a lot of calculations with it. Mm. Now, Interest, uh, it's in inter interest that, uh, in fact, models like that one are the models that you should be using. Because if you use a model that assumes that interest rate can only be positive, like uh, models that follow some normal distribution, basically you, you cannot model effects like in, uh, for Euro, Swiss franc, or JPY, where rates are negative. Yeah. So uh, the interesting challenge we are facing now is really to accommodate some of the all pricing models to account for uh, these negative rate features. And uh, I must say that existing models already accounted for that. Other models didn't. So, but we had to up upgrade them to make sure that they could work also for in a negative rate environment. So I think that's a uh, uh, <laughs> challenging yeah, problem yeah. <laughs> yes, to, to be excited about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we're talking about interest rates, uh, interest rate structures. They clearly have a, a key role to play in, in this area of fixed income. Um, talk to us a little bit more. I mean, you've been discussing that a bit there, but about you know, what, are, what has happened to you know, interest rate structures in recent years? So the fact that, okay, we, uh, we are dealing with a low rate environment, it didn't really help much because, mm. um, you know, uh, people... Uh, had a hard time to structure a deal that was paying some kind of nice yield, mm. unless they were linking the structure to some credit entity, so creating a so-called credit linked note. So I give you some return, maybe, maybe based on LIBOR, conditional on some credit, credit entity being alive at the payment time. So that was maybe one of the few 
ways of getting some kind of yield out of mm. some, uh, um, uh, some structure node based on uh, LIBOR, say. And uh, steepeners, so uh, bets on, uh, on the shape of the, of, the, of the curve, are still there. And uh, so uh, rates are low, but you can still you know, place a bet on uh, the difference between long-term rates and short-term rates. Mm. And this is exactly what's still happening. But in general, I would say you know, uh, swaps are the vast majority of deals. And uh, um, a key question is really, uh, how to collateralize them. So what is really changing is not necessarily the structure itself, but what goes with the structure. So uh, collateral, mm -hmm. uh, is that deal cleared or not? Mm -hmm. So only few currencies can be cleared. And uh, I'm talking about like simple uh, you know, uh, money market swap. Um, and uh, so those are uh, also risky things um, uh, to consider. So, and those are already challenging enough uh, without thinking about more complex, um, uh, more complex structures. And uh, uh, another complexity uh, that um, I've seen actually emerging is on market data, in fact. Mm -hmm. So maybe the complexity is not on the structures anymore, but is on uh, on the, the valuation adjustments in the first place, because those are very complex to value, but also on the market data. So sometimes if you, um, if you uh, do a simple deal, but with a um, known G7, a G10 currency, and so with some emerging uh, currency, mm -hmm. and uh, for which you don't really have like an active uh, interest rate market, there is no yes market, so it's very maybe hard to identify risk free rate. And you know, those are uh, challenging enough structures yeah. you know, for, for clients. I was going to say, yeah, you've mentioned a few there. I mean, are there any other sort of areas or main factors that, that traders in particular should be paying attention to in this area? Factors, yeah, I mentioned the basis. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and uh, basis. In many practical applications, is model as a constant uh, because that's very convenient for many points of view. But in fact, if you look at the history, uh, bid spreads have been moving widely, mm. even more than the LIBOR or OES it, it's themselves, right? Mm. So, um, making assuming them constant is not the proper assumption. Mm. And uh, the things that for the vast majority of applications, that's fine. But there are some uh, uh, specific valuations that require the assumption of some volatility of basis price, for example. So that's a potential source of risk that some traders should be, um, should be aware of. Um, other risk is uh, linked to definition of a proper discount curve, for example, or multiple discount curves, which is connected to the, um, to the present of the OIS market in that currency, to the definition of a risk-free rate, to the definition of a typical collateral rate in, um, in that market. So those are sources of risk that are already there, they are related to interest rates specifically. Mm. Okay, great. Um, to close, um, sort of final question, looking towards the future, I mean, can we expect any new models or theoretical approaches to emerge with regards to interest rates um, looking, looking towards the future? Uh, uh, i tell you frankly, I've been trying to be, uh, you know, one of those creating new models, yeah. hoping that people will <laughs> one day use them. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> It didn't really happen so far. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just joking about it. But it's like, um, because as I said, um, the vast majority of practical applications, it, it is really convenient to assume that uh, basis spread are deterministic. But in fact, there are some applications where your multi-curve model should really be based on uh, a joint evolution of multiple uh, forward and discount curves that are not necessarily um, say, uh, driven by a single driver. Mm. So nowadays we 
pick one anchor curve, typically the three-month LIBOR or um, the OAS curve, depending okay, also on, uh, on what's the uh, standard tenor in your currencies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we assume that one is the main driver of the interest rate variability in the market, and we build the other curves by assuming the deterministic spread on top of this. And we build our multi-curve, say, interest, interest rate model this way. But in fact, the real challenge is to build a full-blown multi-curve model where the distance between different curves also moves stochastically over time. And uh, uh, the reason why those models are hard to apply in practice is because, first of all, they're much more complex. Second of all, because we don't have enough market data to calibrate these models to. And, uh, and uh, also uh, because, as I said before, many structures do not seem to depend so heavily on the stochastic behavior of those spreads. Mm -hmm. But there are some applications where you definitely need to consider that, that, that basis as stochastic. And for example, given that before I mentioned possible alternatives of LIBOR, if one day, maybe in 10 years, somebody will decide to replace um, LIBOR with uh, something else, mm -hmm. to manage the transition period, you will definitely need new models. And those models will be multi-core models. And uh, people will be either applying hopefully some of my models or will some variations of them or something better because the market is evolving yeah. and also knowledge and expertise evolving as well. So you're not giving up yet. You're going to keep working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much. And I know you've, you've been speaking here at the, the, the Risk Management and, and Trading Conference. Uh, you've, been, you've been teaching today. Um, what have been your impressions of the conference? How have you I, found it? It's excellent, excellent. So it's, a, it's the first time he, here, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I must say that uh, I was mostly attending in the past uh, a similar event in Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't measure that because it's a competitor of yours. So that's, <laughs> but um, I think you guys did a great job like, you know, uh, attracting so many people. Not only that, attracting so many uh, great speakers, even Nobel Prize winners, mm. and of course, I mean, uh, um, I see that there is so much interest, and uh, you know, from delegates, but I think that this is a great opportunity also to learn from really the main experts in several different fields. Yeah, you talk about yeah learning. That is probably the sort of the, the key focus um, of of the conference. And I mean, if you had to sort of assess the importance of event, this sort of event in in giving people this, this constant training, especially in Latin America, think about people that are working in the finance industry in Latin America, how important is this sort of this learning process, this constant learning process? I think it's, no, it's extremely important because, okay, so uh, the world is fast changing, fast moving. So uh, um, you can educate yourself, but we are busy with our daily job. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that this applies to everybody, we read uh, far less than we would like. I'm not talking about novels, where I'm really talking about really uh, magazines or journals and uh, news about you know, uh, the financial industry we're mm -hmm. working in. And uh, uh, so sometimes we really need to, you know, opportunities to take a break. Mm -hmm. so I go there, I really need to learn about the hot topics, what really is changing. And, uh, and also, you know, having the possibility to discuss ideas because yeah. this is not just, you know, I think, a learning opportunity is also an opportunity to, uh, to meet people. Yeah. And I think this is also a great uh, thing for delegates to share ideas, to share impressions. Main experts, at the end of the day, are sharing their own ideas. So what's really important is really the possibility to discuss those ideas. And, uh, you know, and sometimes you have panel discussions, people can ask questions, but I think uh, the best is for delegates really to discuss among each other if you know what uh, those experts said makes sense or not, and uh, what are the main challenges in the industry as well. Okay, that's great, Fabio Mercurio. Thank you so much for your time today. That was great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Training Risk and Beyond. Hope you've enjoyed the show, and I look forward to seeing you again on a future show. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Audio